Welcome. Welcome to Freedom House. And I am super excited that I get to talk to you tonight. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I, I love being able to do this. I love that God has called me to do this and that I get to do this with you. So um, we're going to continue on with our sermon series tonight. Um, and our first, uh, first uh, sermon of this series, Pastor Bill talked to us from Matthew chapter 5, and he walked us through the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, and, and how those attitudes, um, when, we, when we put those attitudes to work in our lives, they yield a blessing in our lives and the lives of others. Then last week, Pastor, Pastor Kathy talked to us about um, Matthew chapter 4 and Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. Satan took him out there and he tempted him with all these things. And Jesus did this in order to give us an example of how to overcome temptation and to show us how he truly does understand all of our troubles. Today, I get to share with you about how Jesus heals. He heals our mind, our body, and our soul. And Jesus does heal. You, you know that, right? You get that, that Jesus does heal. Um, and if you don't buy that, by the end of this message, I hope you do. Sometimes when Jesus heals, it isn't like this, you know. That's what we want, right? We want to say, Jesus, heal me. I hurt. My heart is in pain. My body aches. Uh, I've got to have whatever it is. You want, we, we want Jesus to kind of be that um, gumball machine. You put the quarter in, you turn, and then you get the prize. Um, that would be lovely. However, we don't learn <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, sometimes that healing takes time. There's a process in that. And we're going to look at some miracles that happened and then the result. Um, I'm a firm believer in the power of prayer and healing through Jesus Christ. In fact, I've shared with you before my, my daughter's story. Uh, when she was born, she was six weeks premature at five weeks old when she was still supposed to be cooking. She was, uh, con uh, she was very ill with uh, RSV and nearly died. We woke up two o'clock in the morning and she was blue, she was cold, and she was barely breathing. Um, obviously, we raced her to the hospital and we started the prayer chain. And through that prayer chain and the faithfulness of those women in our church that made those phone calls, it was back in the day when you would call the prayer chain leader and then she would call one person and they would call another and they would call another. And pretty soon the whole church knew what your prayer need was. Well, Virginia was that prayer warrior for us, and she called all those people. And through those prayers, our daughter is still with us today, 27 years later. Um, I am a firm believer in the power of prayer and the power that God has to heal. I've witnessed it. Um, and I'm sure there's others of you that have witnessed healing as well. And sometimes that healing isn't physical healing. Sometimes that healing is from wounded emotions, those, those deep wounds that are so hard to even look at that you just don't want to because they hurt too much and you want to just shove those puppies down, they pop out. Deal with them <laughs> because it's better that way. Um, you know, and I, I know these because I've had those feelings. I've dealt with those feelings of worthlessness, inadequacy, unworthiness, feeling less than, We've all been there at some point, right? I know that I am healed from those things because Jesus did the work in me and I allowed him to do the work in me. And it's a partnership. You know, you allow Jesus to come in and he partners with us in that healing process when it's an internal thing. And you guys, I am so thankful that Jesus was my partner and that he did not give up on me. Um, and you know, there are times that those feelings come creeping back in. You know, somebody will say something and there's that trigger and you're like... You're shrinking back into that shell that you thought you had burst out of. And you know what happens? When those, th when those things happen to me, I instantly revert back to my Jesus. And I cry out to him because I know that he will never leave me or forsake me. And I know that he has my back. How do I know this? Well, I've experienced for one. And the Bible tells us that. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. When God starts a work in you, he doesn't leave you hanging. 
Amen? He sees it through. I have confidence in this because that he isn't done with me yet. I am far from perfect. I need lots of help, and I thank God that he is not done with me yet. Tonight, we're going to look at how Jesus heals from the perspective of two different outsiders. These outsiders are not Jews. Far from it, in fact. These outsiders are Roman centurions. Before we dig into the message, I want to give you a snapshot of what a centurion is um, so we can get some context. But before we do that, I really want to pray. God, I'm just so grateful for you tonight. We are so grateful that you are in the house, that your Holy Spirit is with us tonight, that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we can receive healing from those deep-seated wounds and healing in our body, mind, and soul. God, tonight as I present your word, would you just bless it and that would these words that come out of my mouth be your words and received from as they were from you. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... What does a Roman army look like? So they're actually called a cohort legion. I learned that as I was studying. A cohort legion um, com- was comprised of five to 6,000 men, and it was Rome's pr- primary fighting force. The legion contained 10 cohorts of 480 men. Each cohort contained 60 centuries of 80 to 100 men, more like 80. Uh, The centurion was the leader or the captain over this group of men. That's why they're called centurions. The Roman legionary soldiers were typically unmarried men in the age range of 18 to 45. Not only were they Rome's fighting force, they were also expected to build roads, forts, fortresses, and dig canals. He was a salaried professional who would serve a term of 16 to 25 years. After serving out his term, he would be released with a pension or a sum of money accrued in his personal savings account, and sometimes a plot of land or a settlement in a colony. So he was set when he retired. Roman officers or equestrians of senatorial rank could go on to a life in politics um, after serving a much shorter three terms, three-year term. Centurions were well paid. They were paid about 20 times of a regular army man. He had a good salary. A Roman centurion was a man of status um, who most likely had personal servants who took care of his personal needs. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these men who had committed to work for the Roman government as as an army man. And he had a hard job. And uh, he was expected to do a lot of things. So we're going to be looking into Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 5 through 15. If you want to open up your Bible, your favorite Bible app, hopefully that's the Freedom House app, and you can follow along. And I'm going to be reading out of the English Standard Version because it's a new version I've started to love. So I want to share that with you. So we're going to start in, um, in verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. What we're seeing here is pretty astonishing. There's a lot, of, a lot of little pieces I want us to look at. So the first thing is that the centurion would have been, con- would have been considered a Gentile, an outsider, and um, he would no doubt have been considered unclean. For a Jewish man, especially a rabbi, to go into a centurion's home, a, a Gentile's home, would have meant ritual defilement. He would have been unclean. That would have been a bad thing. Um, The fact that Jesus didn't hesitate, and he said, let me go, we'll go heal him, um, speaks volumes to the compassion that Jesus had. And and it also shows us that Jesus didn't have, um, he didn't have glasses that would see color, race, gender. He didn't see any of that. Jesus just saw people. He saw humanity. He saw the children that God had created. And he didn't let any of that get in the way 
of helping someone else. He was willing to, to go through ritual defilement to go into this centurion's home and heal this servant. It wasn't a question. He was just going to do it. That speaks a lot of who Jesus is. In fact, um, you know, God doesn't show us any favoritism. In, in, in uh, Acts chapter 10, Peter tells us that um, he opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. God doesn't have favorites. We're all his favorite. I tell my husband all the time, you're my favorite. And, you know, God, God looks at you and he says, you're my favorite. You're my favorite. You're my favorite. We're all his favorite. He doesn't look at us, any one of us, any differently. And he didn't look at this centurion any differently than he sees us. The other thing that we see is this faith of the Roman centurion. He's desperate to have his, his servant healed. And, you know, he, the, the question isn't even there, will you come? He doesn't ask. He just tells Jesus, my servant is desperately ill. And Jesus just says, shall I go heal him? There was no question. He just, Jesus was going to do it. And, you know, this servant for this centurion was a very dear servant. In Luke, it calls him a dear servant. This, this person that, he's, that is so ill is, is precious to this centurion. So it shows a little bit of the character of the centurion as well. This centurion has been stationed in Capernaum or the nearby areas. So he has been a witness to all that Jesus has done. He has seen the crowds following him. He's seen the miracles. He's heard Jesus teach. And he sees what others are unwilling to recognize. He sees that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, that all of the others, the people of Israel, the Jewish nation, have failed to recognize. He sees it. He acknowledges that he is unworthy to have Jesus enter his home. I am unworthy. I'm a man of, of authority. I understand. I tell my servant to go. You just tell him to be healed. He is trusting. He has absolute faith and confidence that all Jesus has to do is say the word and it's done. How cool is that? As this military man, he is confident in the ability of Jesus to heal by just saying the word. And he knows that whatever Jesus commands, it will be done. What faith this man has. Let's take a minute to take your faith temperature. We're all accustomed to having our temperature taken these days, right? You go to the doctor and this thing gets pointed at your face. Um, sometimes different grocery stores or whatever you'll get. So we're going to take our spiritual temperature. If I was to point this at your spiritual forehead, what would your temperature be? What would your faith temperature be? Is it the faith of this soldier that just says, be just your word. You don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy. You just... Just say the word and it'll be done. Do we have that kind of faith? Or maybe is our faith temperature a little bit cold? Let's look at um, another soldier. Actually, not another soldier. We're going to look down just a little bit further at the rest of this scene. So in Matthew um, 8, 10 through 13, it says, When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, no one in Israel have I found such faith. Nowhere in Israel has he found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus says, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Praise God. His simple faith. That deep faith was what healed his servant and his confidence that Jesus would do it. Now, there's something else that was a little bit surprising. Did you see the surprise in Jesus? It says that he marveled. In another translation, it says he was astonished at the faith of this centurion because he hadn't found that anywhere. Jesus, at this point in his ministry, had been around for a while. 
And there were lots of people that he had talked to, that he had taught, that he had healed, that he had fed. He had done a lot of things that people had seen. Yet, he hadn't been received like this by the very people that he came to minister to. He found a person of genuine faith, and it came from an outsider, a Gentile, a Roman centurion at that. He is astonished to see such faith in a Gentile. And Jesus commends his faith. And he tells him that no other person in all of Israel has such faith. What a statement. I got to tell you, if there were very many um, Jewish leaders around, I'm sure that they were not happy with this. It would have been quite a slap in the face because this Gentile who had most likely participated in many crucifixions or tortures or whatever, did not live a godly life, was a Roman, so he probably worshipped other gods. And here he's saying that this Gentile had such faith. It should have been a, it should have been a gut check for anyone around that was a, was a Jew to, see, to hear that. And Jesus rewards this faith and says, as as you have said, let it be done. And the servant was healed at that moment. So another significant thing in this text is that this is the first time it's recorded that Jesus healed from a distance. Any other time that we see up to this point, he is in their presence. He touches them. He puts mud on their eyes or whatever. Um, but he's in their presence when he heals them. This is the first time that we see that Jesus spoke the words from a distance and that person was healed. And really, if you think about it, this is just a preview of what is to come later when the Holy Spirit is poured out and we are given that power to go out and the power that Jesus had to heal, he gives to us. This centurion is changed forever. Now I want us to look at another centurion. In Mark chapter 15, verse 39, we're going to look at the centurion that was on the cro at the cross. And this centurion was one who is accustomed to participating in executions. He was a witness to Jesus' scourging, his mocking, his being spat upon, and his humiliation. He's standing there at the cross when he hears Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was there when Jesus took his last breath. He witnessed the piercing of Jesus' side and the gush of water from his chest. He was so moved by what he had seen. The scripture tells us in Mark 15, 39, that when the, and then when the centurion was stood facing him, saw that it was this way, he breathed his last and he said, truly, this man was the son of God. This soldier had become a believer I have a video that I want you to watch that will kind of go along with this, and it's from the, the perspective of this soldier, and I think it'll really speak to you about how this soldier was touched by Jesus. You've had that feeling when you realize something, but it's too late, when all you want to do is just step back in time, but all you get is just to turn around and stare at it and you wish for a different outcome, you wish for a second chance, but you don't get it. I've got a pocket full of those kind of feelings. I was there that day at the foot of the cross. A shell of a man, a heart hardened to emotion, to death, to gore. I was the one that nailed him to it. Like I had done hundreds of times to countless thieves and robbers and rebels that had gone before him. things. He said things 
life just didn't seep out of him. He seemed to decide when to let go. You ever been in a conversation with someone that says that they, uh, that they forgive you and you kind of bow up because you don't think you need forgiven, but deep down you know there isn't something just quite right? And you do one or two things. You, you either keep thinking about it and it just makes you angry or that man, uh, Jesus, that day on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he looked at me. He, uh, And then it, and then it just, it just hit me like, like a, like a, like a, like, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a biting wind. I break people. I break their bones. I nail their hands and their feet. I stab them in the side. You need forgiven when you're just doing your job and you're just doing it right. I'm the one that needs to be forgiven. I looked up at him and I knew he was and is the Son of God. that get you right there? <laughs> I've watched that a number of times, and every time it gets me right here. The soldier was touched by Jesus. This was an artistic license. The, the scripture doesn't tell us that this is exactly how the centurion responded, but we can imagine that this is exactly what happened. Jesus heals that centurion, he was touched forever. And I guarantee you his life was never the same because he encountered Jesus. His life was different. Jesus heals. He doesn't just heal bodies, but he heals minds and souls. He doesn't just check to select a, uh, he doesn't choose a select few. He lavishly pours out his love on all of mankind. Isaiah 53, 5 says that but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus came to bind up our wounds and free us from a bondage to sin. Throughout Scripture, we see that Jesus heals all kinds of ailments. If you read through chapter 8 and 9, you'll see that Paralyzed men walk again. Demon-possessed people find freedom from a lifetime of despair. Blind men see. The mute speak. Leprously, leprosy is miraculously gone, and he brings the dead back to life. The thing that all of these things, all these instances have in common is faith. Jesus would ask them, do you want to be healed? And they would say yes. 
And he would say, your faith has healed you. His compassion never fails. I want to have the band come up. And as they're getting ready um, to play a song, I've got a little more to talk to you about. So are you like the Roman centurion? Have you been a witness to the goodness of God, but have hung on the outside looking in? Are you ready to say, like the centurion at the cross, surely this is the Son of God? Are you ready to give your life to him? Let's take our temperature again. Where is your faith? Is it strong enough to believe in Jesus' power to heal your mind, body, and soul? When we release our will to the will of God, our faith grows and we can be healed. The first step towards that healing is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Invite him in. The next step is to tell someone you did it. Then get connected in a Bible teaching church that can help you grow in your faith. And of course, we want that to be Freedom House. Healing begins with Jesus. As the band plays um, and we go to prayer, I want you to take some personal time praying. Take an inventory. Ask God to seek your heart and show you where your faith needs to be bigger. And I'm going to let them do their thing.
Thanks, guys. As you were taking some time to pray, if you ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, please let us know. If you're online, send us a message or give us a call. All of our information will be on the bottom of the screen. Um, we want to partner with you in growing your faith, no matter where you are. Um, next week, Pastor Kathy will be talking to us about new life. She told me that earlier, and I completely spaced it. Um, and I want to pray for you tonight before we leave. Father God, this has been a great night. You have been here. We have seen through the eyes of the centurion how amazing you are, how you heal, how you don't see color, you don't see race, you don't see gender, you just see people. God, we are so grateful that you are a God who sees us right as we are, where we are, no matter what circumstance we are in. God, you see us. And God, when we trust in you, you bring healing to our mind, our bodies, and our souls. God, we just pray healing over our people tonight, the, the people who are, who are hurting, who have deep wounds that are so, so deep that they're just gushing. God, we pray that your anointing and your healing would go into those deep wounds and you would help them to heal. God, we pray for those who have physical ailments, who are in need of surgeries, who have chronic pain, who, whatever the ailment is, Lord, we just pray for your healing over those, those problems, Lord, that you would bring relief from the pain, that you would just cast out the dizziness, that you would just be in the moment, Lord, that you would bring healing to those bodies. God, we thank you for Freedom House, and we ask your blessing upon our community, um, that you would use Freedom House to shine for you in Yamhill County. God, we love you so much, and we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.